Well, good morning, everybody. So glad you're here today. Are you excited? A few of you are. It's good. My right side is. My left side. Okay, you'll catch up. Hey, if you're joining us online, so glad you're here today. My name is Joel Adorman. Whether you're online or here, my name is still Joel, and I'm the lead pastor here. Glad you're with us. We know there are lots of different types of people that join us online. Some of you are joining us online because you're sick or under the weather, out of town. You can't make it, and so you're watching this either in real time or you're watching it later on. We're glad you're with us uh, too. And then we know there's also a certain group of people that they check us out online before they ever join us in person. And we know you do that, and that's great. We're so glad you're with us today, and we're going to be like a leprechaun finding their pot of gold when you are able to join us here in person. But thanks for being with us. Whatever the reason is you're joining us online today, welcome. I want to start today in the message talking a little bit about when uh, a, a small little error makes a big problem. Now, believe it or not, yours truly tries to teach from memory, but sometimes that has some problems. There are times when occasionally you can get words mixed up and things come out the wrong way. Or you get an idea, you're thinking three sentences ahead, and the idea you say isn't the idea that you're thinking of three sentences ahead. And in the very first church I was lead pastor at, I was probably eight, nine weeks in, maybe a few, a little bit longer, I don't know now, but... And I made a statement in passing. I said something into the reference of 15,000 years of written history. And I said it and I went on and I didn't think anything of it. And I wasn't even talking about history. It was, it was literally, that was an, an introductory phrase onto a sentence that was a, about the topic. And I went on and I noticed there were some weird looks. Some of you give me the same look now because you've already caught it. And, you get, and, now I got all this, and I'm like, what in the, am I thinking? Am I not connecting well? What's going on? And, and I finally get to the very, very end. And then a, a history teacher in the congregation walks up and she goes, do you really think we have 15,000 years of written history? And I said, well, no, no, it's not written history. You see, that statement is wrong. And I was wrong to say it. What I meant to say is 15,000 years of recorded history. We only have a few thousand years that we've been able to write. So, I mean, and then you go, well, what's the big difference? Well, the big difference is several thousand years. And it was inaccurate. And it really threw people off who knew the right answer. Now, my sphere of influence is, is small compared to some pastors, and it's larger compared to, I don't know, some, I guess, suppose. But then that was also like pre-live streaming days. <laughs> that was also, I didn't know where I had to worry about a few hundred people maybe watching online. It was just, it was, I mean, it was pretty small. I came up the next Sunday, I corrected it, and I went on, and I probably made more problems by correcting it than I didn't even saying it. But it was wrong, and I had to correct it. Well, what happens, though, when a pastor's influence is not just a few hundred or even a thousand? What if it's a few, you know, tens of thousands? Maybe tens of thousands of pastors actually listen to a pastor, and then all their congregation, you could get up into 100,000 people pretty soon. Now, certainly, pastors are no stranger to controversy. Uh, if we take a stand on anything, it's controversial. But sometimes we take stands and we have uh, maybe some unintended consequences. And perhaps that's what happened back in October 2019 when Christianity Today ran an article entitled, Dr. John MacArthur, No Stranger to Controversy. Now, you know <laughs> that they're going to write something controversial about something he said, or they wouldn't have put that. Well, here's what the article said. It said, last week, now bear in mind, this is October 2019, okay? They said, they wrote this. Last week, John MacArthur celebrated 50 years in the pastorate at a conference at his congregation, Grace Community Church. During the event, MacArthur accused the Southern Baptist Convention of taking a headlong plunge towards allowing women preachers after women spoke at the SBC's 2019 annual meeting. That, he said, was a sign that the denomination no longer believed in biblical authority. When you literally overturn the teaching of Scripture, uh, Dr. MacArthur is quoted as saying, to empower people who want power, you've given up biblical authority. A moderator also asked MacArthur and his fellow panelists to offer their gut reactions to one- and two-word phrases. When the moderator said, Beth Moore, MacArthur replied, go home. Now, I don't say this to bash on Dr. MacArthur. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. We'll meet in heaven. And, and I, I have some of the books he's written. A lot of pastors. Under, I mean, theologically, we're in the camp on a lot of issues with him. Uh, this is nothing about bashing him. But it is about saying that we have to be careful with our words sometimes. Now, I, I can also say this because Dr. MacArthur came back and doubled down on the comments and said, no, I admit exactly what I said. <laughs> And Christianity Today runs a follow-up, and it's like the follow-up was worse than the original. But again, the impact, the ramifications, how that unfolded was so much bigger than the, actually what he said. And it just kept unfolding and unfolding. And the reality is, 
I mean, did the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the world, did they actually give up biblical authority? Well, of course they didn't. But philosophically, that's how he felt. And so he said how he felt, but no one wanted to give him how he felt. They just, it became this big mess. Now, before you think that we're, I'm somehow defending our tribe, I'm not. Um, we've been unaffiliated for a long, long time. And then before that, when we were affiliated with a Baptist denomination, it wasn't the Southern Baptist Convention. So we have no dog in that race. So I'm not defending us. I'm not defending him. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm just saying when our platform gets bigger, we get a whole lot more attention. But what happens when your platform is over a billion people? What happens when your platform is so big that over a billion people on this planet pay attention to what you say? Maybe you heard something about what broke in the news in February 2022. Yeah, like last month. When this Catholic uh, priest got himself in trouble because the Catholic Church invalidated thousands of their baptisms because he said, we baptize you instead of I baptize you. And they invalidated all these baptisms that he had done. And then they come to find out there were some other priests doing the same type thing, and it just made a mess. Now, if you don't have a Catholic friend or if you were not born Catholic or raised Catholic, you might not understand the significance of this. Because what it means to a Catholic in Catholic theology is if your baptism as an infant is invalidated, then that means your catechism was invalidated, which means your first communion was invalidated. Now, let me, let me show you how that piles up. So in Catholic theology, what that means is you have to do these steps, and eventually it ends in heaven. So if your first step is wrong, the whole thing is wrong, which means potentially they're scared to death that they might not get to heaven because it didn't count. That's what it meant. That's why it was so controversial, because in Catholic theology, that was massive. But yet, to my Catholic friends, even here, maybe those watching who kind of are kicking the tires on what does it mean to not be Catholic but to be something else, the Bible never says that. The Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that our salvation is a gift of grace. It is something God has done for us, not something we do. Specifically, it says it's not works. It's not a stair step that we do a certain thing, and then when we get in a pile of religious things, God goes, oh, good job, you get to come into heaven. Because none of us could be good enough anyway. So God sent Jesus down to save us. It's not something we work for. But if you used to be Catholic or if you have Catholic friends, this is a major problem because there's over a billion Catholics in the world. This was huge. And they're still trying to figure out what does this mean? And there's experts in Catholic canon law trying to figure out what does this mean for all these people now, some of which, some of them are adults now. What does it mean? I mean, this is, this is the problem we can get into sometimes when we, when we build up all these traditions and all these barnacles on the ship of the gospel and we begin to add all this stuff to it to where we, become use, we start using religion now as a, a, a way to prove how much better we are than someone else and how much closer to God we are because we've done a certain number of things. Or maybe we, we associate uh, with the fact that we're better than others because we're not like them. You know, we don't do certain things and so now we get to look down on other people. That's the problem of bad religion. That's the problem when good Christianity goes wrong, when we add all this other stuff. And the problem is we become, essentially, we start feeding the beast. We start feeding that which is destroying us. So in this series, Bad Religion, we're not trying to point the fingers out at anybody. We're looking at us. We're saying, what are we doing that is taking good Christianity and helping it go wrong? Because it's easy to point the finger, but that's terrible. No, it's bad manners to point at people. But also, we got to look at ourselves. What am I contributing to this? What are you contributing to this? And today, we're talking about a very touchy subject of this religious liars, people who lie in the name of religion. Now, the Bible is not silent on this very subject because we're not the first people that have added things to what God told us to do. Not at all. This is, I guess, as old as humanity itself. But Jeremiah chapter 23 is where we're going to be to talk about this. Jeremiah 23, 9 through 40 and that is a very long passage. We're going to be hitting some summaries in some of the sections of that passage because we, I would need like 30 minutes probably by itself just to read that. So we're going to be jumping around through that. It's page 534 and 535 in the Pew Bible there in front of you. And if you do not have a, a print Bible of your own and you would like one, please keep this as a gift. We would love for you to receive this and keep this. I love it when our team comes through during the week and they say, well, this happened just this past week. They said, wait, we have to order another case of Bibles because you guys took so many, and that is wonderful. I love it. You want to take some for a friend? Take them. This is an incredible gift we can give people, and uh, we buy these by the case, so we get them for a really good price. I'd love for you to take these. Give them to a friend. Take, keep it for yourself. 
But whether you're taking it to borrow or taking it to keep, it's page 534 in that Bible. As we jump around, it's going to get to 535. You can look it up in your own Bible. Words are on your screen. And here we go into just the first, uh, first few verses right here at the beginning, just to kind of set the stage. Jeremiah 23, 9 through 15. This gives us a pretty good overview of what's happening. We're jumping right into the middle of this, and we read, Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I'm like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome with wine because of the Lord and His holy words. The land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land lies parched, and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they're punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, now Samaria we talked about last week. That's the capital city of Israel, the northern kingdom. Okay, civil war divides the kingdom. That's the northern kingdom. Last week we talked about that. And among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal, which was a pagan god of fertility, uh, and led my people of Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the capital city of the southern kingdom of Judah. I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen, their hand, they strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Now the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. Verse 15, I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water because from the prophets of Jerusalem ungodliness has spread throughout the land. As we move into this passage, we see what's going on here. The prophets intentionally lied and betrayed the role of being a prophet. Prophets really had one job. I mean, you know, the old joke, you had one job to do. They had one job. Their job was to tell the king, this is what the Lord says. Now, by extension, the fact that they're telling the king that, and they're sometimes preaching these oracles, sometimes they're writing them down, the people would hear what God would say. So they would say, this is what God says. These prophets were all lying about it, though. They weren't telling the truth of what was happening. They were simply saying what people wanted to hear. And so they're betraying this role as prophet because no one would listen to them if they weren't prophets. This was like an official role in their nation. So people listened to them because they were prophets and they intentionally lied about it. So then we go on. As we see Jeremiah as this lone voice of truth, he says this, verse 16 and 17, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say no harm will come to you. Now down to verse 30. Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another's words, supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lives, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least. Now, uh, in in this section, we see this shocking reality that the people actually lied in the name of the Lord. They intentionally lied, dropping God's name into the equation. They would say, this is what the Lord says, and then they'd lie. You've got to be pretty brave to intentionally mislead people and then name drop the Almighty while you're doing it. Hey, God told me to tell you, and then you just bold-faced lie. That's what they did. And so they would tell some people, hey, you know, you're good. No harm's going to come on you to people who are living in sin. Hey, you're... You're cool. God's not going to do anything to you. God said he's not going to harm you. And, and, and Jeremiah is wringing his hands at this. He's saying, don't you understand what's going to happen? Do you understand what the Lord is telling you? Because Jeremiah is actually speaking what God has told him to say. And what Jeremiah is telling him is God didn't send these people. Plug your ears up. Don't listen to them. They're not telling you the truth. What they're saying is not from the Lord. He's begging them. Don't listen to them. Because God did say, don't listen to them. Now imagine how muddied up Jeremiah's voice gets in the middle of all this, because he's the one person telling the truth. 
And we don't know exactly how many outnumbered him by, but he could be outnumbered by as many as hundreds of prophets. And he's the only person saying this. Then tragically, we get down to verses 37 through 40. This is what you keep saying to a prophet, these false prophets. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is a message from the Lord, this is what the Lord says. You use the words, this is a message from the Lord, even though I told you that you must not claim this is a message from the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence along with the city I gave to you and your ancestors. I will bring on you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. That's, that's hard medicine. That's tough. And the Lord is telling us that He's going to punish these religious liars both for their own sin and the repercussions among His people. See, it wasn't just the prophets that would be punished. They would be. They would be forgotten. The Lord said, I will cast you out. I will deal with you as I need to deal with you. But the repercussions of that were huge. Because in time, it wouldn't just be the prophets that would go through this. The prophets, the priests, the kings, and the people would all suffer. All because these prophets simply didn't tell the truth. And they intentionally misled God's people. They intentionally misled the kings. They intentionally lied and didn't say what was the truth. And then they name-dropped the Lord in the middle of all their lies. And the Lord's sick and tired of having himself misquoted, misrepresented. Because he's not saying these things. He's telling these people, you need to repent. You need to come back to me. These prophets are just masking all of that. I mean, they're running right towards a cliff, and these prophets are practically pushing them over. And the Lord is begging them, stop. Your destruction is right around the corner. I mean, what we see in Jeremiah, this warning we find here is something we find even into the New Testament. When James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes this in James chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I am very aware that that's talking about me. I'm very aware of that. The weight of that hits me every single time. I tell people the hardest thing is not running a growing church. Operating, managing staff, that's easy. Outreach to our community, that's, that's easy. Making sure that I am in line with the Bible and that I present the Bible in a faithful way and I don't unintentionally lead you astray, that's hard work. That's tough. That's sobering reality because the Lord takes very seriously the repercussions because it's not just me. I influence you. You influence others. I influence the people watching online. You influence others. You might share this with someone else. I am very aware of what James says in James 3.1, and he's echoing what the prophets have said. There's a consequence when we lead people astray. Now, we can argue about God's punishment as a, you know, when it's accidental versus something intentional, but y'all, the end result's about the same. You're still misleading God's people, and it's a very sobering reality. Perhaps that's why the Apostle Paul uh, says this to his young protege, Timothy, a passage we still use today when we ordain pastors. This reminder, this encouragement, but also a warning in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. When he tells Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you... Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, there's a lot of focus on this idea of itching ears and surrounding ourselves with people that tell us what we want to hear. Now, the most obvious example of this would be like the the theological liberal. You know, that's the idea that we strip away all the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about hell very much because that's bad. We don't want to talk about sin. We sure don't want to talk about my sin. You know, we don't want to talk about the bad parts. We just want to talk about the good parts. We want to say that God is love, but we don't want to say God is just. So we don't say that part. We just say love. We just say grace. We just say hope. We just say peace. We never say the bad news. We just talk about the good news. That's part of it. But there's a whole other side of it, too. The whole other side of it is the like, polar opposite. That's where we talk about nothing but hell. 
Nothing but justice. Nothing but God's judgment. Nothing but the fact that God is just waiting to smite us down for our sinful behavior. And you can usually tell the preacher types when you turn off the sound. Someone's going to do this online and comment. I'm just waiting for one of you to do this who's watching us live. You're going to mute the sound and you're going to watch body language and you'll know which camp they're in. Because this side, it's always this. I do that half the time, so I will look like that online. The other side is this. And they're usually talking about the joy of the Lord with that face. And they're actually, they're usually not pointing at you. They're usually pointing out there because they're talking about how the world is so sinful. But you're okay. You're better than they are. Just turn the volume off and you'll figure out which camp they're in. The problem is both are wrong. Both are sinful. Both mislead God's people. Both are too extreme. Both completely, this side ignores God's love and God's grace and what Jesus did on the cross and makes it entirely about judgment and hell. This side never gets to the bad news, so the good news never sounds really good because you don't understand how bad it is. The reality is we're called to straddle a tension between the two because our itching ears don't want to think. We don't want to evaluate this and say, does that seem graceful? Does that seem merciful? Or to this side, we want to go, is that the whole truth? I mean, God is love, yes, but God will also condemn us to hell for our unbelief. Do, are, we, are we checking that? Are we checking both sides out by Scripture? Or are we just kind of swallowing the morsels because it's easier for us just to simply go, okay, that sounds like what I want to hear. Because on this side, I feel better about myself because the world is so evil. On this side, I feel better about myself because I'm just a really good person. But neither one of them are the whole truth. And yet both of them contain part of the truth. That's the problem. It's almost right. It's almost complete. It's, it's almost dead on, but just off enough. Like a ship sailing in the ocean. A one degree difference on that rudder won't make a difference right now, but you get a few miles down the road, you get a hundred miles down the sea, you get, you get a thousand miles over, and you've missed it by a continent. See, that's the problem. It may just be one degree off. That's the scary part. But fast forward 2,000 years, and America is the proud owner of over 20,000 distinct denominations. But it's just one degree difference. But 2,000 years down the road, you start wondering, why do we have all these different groups and nobody can get along? Because we're all one degree off. It's, just, it's a little bit. Because it's almost right. It's almost right on. But see, that's what, by the Holy Spirit, this is not the best the grace of God can do. We can do better because he wants to do better. Because disciples of Jesus, catch this, disciples of Jesus must pursue what is right, not what sounds right. You see, we have to understand that we live in a culture that influences us all the time, me included. We live in a culture that influences us 24-7. The news, social media, books, everything we read, it influences us all the time. And so asking us about our own culture is often like asking a fish to describe the water, and the fish would go, what water? That's us in our culture. And so oftentimes, nowadays, what sounds right is not right. What sounds right is, well, God just loves everybody. Is that right? Yes, it is. But he's also holy. And he demands that we live a life worthy of the calling he's put on our life. He demands a repentance for our sin. He demands a price for our sin. That's what the cross means. Good Friday, we're going to talk about that a lot. We've got to pursue what is right, not just what sounds right. Because oftentimes what sounds right conveniently makes us feel pretty good. Not just, I'm not just saying because you feel pretty good means it's wrong. It just means you've got to pursue what really is right. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. When, I mean, when Christians have dealt with this issue from the beginning a couple of de uh, centuries ago. He says this. He says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Isn't that good? I wish I'd said it. I didn't. He did. I wish I'd said it first because that's a good one. It's not, it's not right and wrong. It's right and almost right because a disciple of Jesus is to pursue what is right, not what sounds right, which means we have to focus on getting it right. We have to focus on actually getting it right, getting it in our heads, getting it in our hearts, figuring out what are we really called to do and called to be? What does it mean to live as people of the book? What does that mean? What does that mean? How do you walk that out? 
Well, one thing we can do is this. We get into the Bible so it gets into you. I say that almost every single Sunday. I intentionally didn't say it today because I knew I was going to say it at the end. But I say this almost every Sunday because I really believe that. I don't want you just you know, hook, line, and sinker swallowing everything I'm saying. I can be wrong. I'm a person. I grow. I change. I adapt. I, I look at Scripture. It teaches me something new. I, I, you know, I can be wrong. Believe it or not, yours truly can be wrong. Get into the Bible so it gets into you. Now, how do we get into the Bible? You have to actually read it. Okay, we talk about SIPS, S-I-P-S, our personal worship time. Last Sunday, that was our application. So last week, go back and listen to that if you missed it. All these coasters and bookmarks that says take your SIPS, all that stuff. The I of SIPS is investigate. That's getting into the Bible. It's asking those journalistic questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? What's going on here? Summarizing that passage in a single sentence. Everything you might have hated when you were doing English classes. But it's going to help you understand this. Summarize the story. What's happening? Of all the things God could have put into the Bible, why is that there? What's going on? What's the setting? What's the story? You can do this. We, we as Americans, 21st century Americans, we are swimming in information. Google almost any question you'll probably find. One of your top hits will probably be a website called Got Questions, which is a great website. Uh, it's a Christian-run website for uh, questions about the Bible. But we have, and it's free, we have all kinds of information to figure out what's going on here. Get into the Bible. The next part is so it gets into you. I don't want you just to stop with going, oh, that's so interesting. Look at that. Wow. You're not done until you ask one question. You are not done with your Bible study until you ask one very, it is the most important question you could ever ask of the Bible. One, one, you ready for this? One very important question that you have to ask or you're not done with your Bible study. You ready? If you're ready, say I'm ready. 50 of you are ready. Here's the answer. Okay, you're not done until you ask this question. So what? So what do I do with this? So what am I called to do, be, or think, or become? Because I've read this. Of all the things God could have put in here, so what am I supposed to do with this? See, it's all God's Word from the book of Ephesians, which is quite easy to figure out and apply, to the book of Leviticus, which is a lot harder the book of Revelation is his word just as much as the book of Job, as uncomfortable as it might personally make me. Yeah. It's all his word, which means he put it there for a reason. So what? So what do I do with that? See, I'm a pragmatist, so my attitude is you're thinking it anyway, so just answer the question. So what? So what about answering a fool in his folly? Answer the question. Get into the Bible so it gets into you, because that's what makes a difference. Okay? That's the first suggestion. Second suggestion is complete the discussion guide that is in your me- with your message notes every Sunday. We do this as a dis- this discussion guide is actually for our sermon-based small groups, which I think you all need to be in a small group, and I'm a personal uh, fan of the sermon-based ones. But whether you are or not, it's not the point. The point is, it's always in there. And because of some feedback we got from some of our groups, we're going to keep publishing this even when our groups aren't meeting. Because we want people to stay getting in in this and engaged in this. This really takes the message, and it doesn't just regurgitate it. That would be so boring. Oh, my goodness. Um, Anyway, uh, so what what it does, though, is it it goes in all the different directions that time doesn't allow us to go here. It chases the rabbits. It goes down the rabbit trails and the tangents, and then comes back to that main idea and that whole, so what? It deals with a lot with application. Now, I'm going to give you a very, you know, meta moment here. Okay, Application is what I'm doing, like, right now. That is literally what I'm doing in this part of the sermon. But the discussion guide takes that to the next level and really helps you personalize that and say, okay, what am I going to do with this? How do I now do something different? What do, as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, what step do I take next? Because that, that's part of that whole getting into the Bible. So it gets into you. That's part of getting it right, not just taking what you're hearing and just saying, okay, that, sound, that sounds great. Because there's a difference between Bible study and application. There's a difference. Bible study is what did it say Applications, what does it mean? What do I do with that? How do I walk that on a Monday morning when I got to go into work with those, you know, not so nice people and I got to somehow now be Jesus to them? How do I do that? That's what we're talking about. And then the discussion guy will we'll often get into those issues. We'll get into those issues with marriages, into those issues with your friends or with school. We, we get into all that because we can't cover every situation here because there's just too many needs. So we hit big applications, and then we depend on the groups to do kind of the smaller ones. 
and to get it into your life because that's what we want. Because we want you to get it right. I want you to get it right. I want you to walk this out Monday through Saturday like a champion for Jesus and figure it out and, and have this spiritual radar that you go, oh, that, that's, that's close to right, but that's not quite right. Not so you can be a jerk about it. There's a difference between being a jerk and saying, have you considered and helping somebody. There's a difference. But you're going to know because you're going to be studying it for yourself, and you're going to know what is right and not just what sounds right. I mean, Jeremiah had the unfortunate job of being this lone voice of truth in a sea of liars, a sea of hypocrites and prophets who would just tell people whatever they wanted to hear. And later in, in, in Jeremiah, you even get the idea that they're being paid to say some of this stuff. It was a terrible time for Jeremiah. And yet he represented God to these people. And he told the truth. And that's what we're called to do. That's what I'm called to do. It's what every one of our Bible teachers are called to do is tell the truth. But you are too when you get out there and now you're the preacher for everyone else. When you're the one preaching Jesus to everybody else and you're showing that in your life, and I mean preach in a good way, not in a bad way. When you're showing that in your life, you are the Jeremiah to them. You're bringing what the Lord says to them. And that may not always be happy and feel good stuff, but it leads to life. And that makes it the best news ever. Because if we're not careful, if we just go with what sounds right instead of what actually is right, then we can become accomplices or, or maybe just even outright liars, all in the name of religion. And our Lord had some strong words about that. And I don't want that for you, and I don't want that for me. What I want is for the world to see us embracing the tough truth of who Jesus really is and what he really wants to do in our lives which means less of me and more of him.